in 1886, the US Navy was at an adir. The most advanced vessel they possessed was the newly commissioned protected cruiser USS Atlanta, a ship a quarter the size of some of its contemporaries. But in July that year, a baby was born in Baltimore, named Raymond Ames Spruance. He was descended on his mother's side from a family which could lay claim to having been present on the East Coast for at least half a century prior to the United States even being a thing, and on his father's side, his American heritage went back about as far as the nation itself. He spent his formative years bouncing back and forth between Indianapolis, which his mother preferred for its intellectual scene, and Baltimore, where she was from, where the family would spend their summers. Aged around six or seven, with two younger brothers, the young Raymond found himself entrusted to the care of his wider family so that his mother could concentrate on the youngest boy, who had been born frail and developmentally challenged. In this environment, the young Raymond Spruance grew into a young man with a superb academic record, although he also had a sideline in rearing chickens for their eggs, which he would then sell to provide himself with some pocket money. However, signs of a great naval leader seemed to be lacking. He appeared to have no real desire to be in charge of anything, and bucked against authority in almost all of its forms. One visit to the West Point Academy had a young Raymond declare that formation marching to orders held no appeal to him. Unfortunately, in his teenage years, his wider family ended up going bankrupt, and he had to move back to his mother and father in Indianapolis where he continued raising chickens, although now in earnest rather than just as a hobby. For personal gratification, he took up hiking. But upon turning 16 in 1902, no part of his family, immediate or distant, had anything like the funds to allow him to attend college. Considering the options, his mother decided that the Naval Academy would be the best place for him. It would provide a good education and a respected profession all for free, assuming, of course, that he could get admitted in the first place. The US Navy of this time was considerably larger and more respected than it had been when he was born, having just come out of the Spanish-American War, and new ships were being built at quite a pace. The following year there was a competitive exam in the state of New Jersey, where his wider family lived, and Spruance took said exam and passed with flying colours. Around the same time, his mother managed to use her social connections to get a congressional appointment to the academy from one of the Indiana congressmen. Now faced with double admittance to the academy, Spruance was definitely in, entering as part of a class of 266 hopefuls, of which just over 78% would end up graduating. He entered the academy on the 2nd of July 1903, a day before he turned 17, but despite his own academic performance, it would not be an easy ride. Over a dozen of his classmates were bright enough to eventually reach flag rank, and would include Isaac C. Kidd, who would go on to be the highest ranking casualty at Pearl Harbor, as well as one John S. McCain, and a whippet thin Frank Jack Fletcher. Initially, he was faced with long days marching through an Annapolis summer carrying a heavy rifle. Spruance found himself detesting his lot at this stage, but that lasted until the main classes began, where his keen mind meant that he was able to learn quickly and easily, thus achieving good marks. His first cruise at sea was aboard Admiral Farragut's old flagship, the USS Hartford, in 1904, where in a calculated move he observed that those who had taken the apparently easier positions in the rigging on the lower yard arms were rapidly turning green from exposure to the ship's boiler gases, which were coming up via the ship's funnel. And so instead, he secured himself a station on the topsail yard, considerably higher and harder to get to, but far enough away from the funnel that it gave him clear air. Unfortunately for both him and those on the yard arms below, it was while stationed up here that he discovered a lifelong predilection to seasickness in heavy weather. The upper third of the class, which included Spruance, were then kept at the academy over the summer of 1906 instead of being sent away on leave to allow them to graduate earlier. As more and more ships were entering service, the academy was struggling to supply enough young officers to man them all. He graduated on the 12th of September, 
as the 25th out of 209 to complete their education in that particular class. His first assignment was to the USS Iowa, a pre-dreadnought, not some time-travelling monster-fast battleship, and her task was to wander up and down the east coast of the United States, while practically anything newer than her was preparing to head off with the Great White Fleet. Luckily for Spruance, the Iowa was due a spell in Norfolk Navy Yard for a refit, and still facing a shortage of officers, he was immediately transferred to the brand new Connecticut-class USS Minnesota, which had commissioned earlier that year, and whose crew were still faintly buzzed from the fumes of all the new paint. The young midshipman thoroughly enjoyed all the new ports and people he got to meet, as Minnesota was of course part of the Great White Fleet. Of course, this was mitigated somewhat by the fleet running into major storms, which meant he had to spend a lot of time at the side rails. But he did manage to get an invitation to a party when the fleet was in Japan, where Admiral Togo, the recent victor of the Russo-Japanese War, was the guest of honour. Now an ensign, as opposed to a midshipman, Spruance was on a track to command but he now decided that he must become an engineering specialist to better understand all the new technology that was flowing into the Navy with each new ship. Upon the Great White Fleet's return to the USA, he therefore left the Minnesota and spent a year at the General Electric Company for advanced instruction in the wonders of electricity and its application. A 1910 would see a return to sea, this time aboard the Connecticut itself, and it's often held that this would be the making of him. Prior to this voyage, he was generally seen as a fit and intelligent, but shy and unassuming officer. Someone who would be good for the lower ranks of officership, to keep the ship operational, but not really a leader of men. But Captain Bill Rush of the Connecticut was a character of note. His commands ran well, but they were not happy ships, for he was given to being hard, demanding, and subject to bursts of apparent temper. However, all of this seemed to be for a cause. The young Ensign Spruance at first appeared to be a bit of a pushover, and thus he attracted a larger than average portion of the captain's wrath. But with his back to the wall, that old streak of anti-authoritarianism came to the fore, and Spruance pushed back. The captain didn't let up, but he was duly impressed by the spine displayed by the young officer, and wrote excellent fitness reports. Unaware of this, uh, Spruance requested a transfer while he was on a period of leave in 1911, only to receive the following by way of reply. Mr. Spruance is informed that, if he submitted this application for detachment in the belief that his performance of duty is not satisfactory, he is hereby informed that his performance of duty is generally very satisfactory, and that the commanding officer has no wish for him to leave the ship. The matter was then left in Spruance's hands. He chose to uphold his transfer request, but no orders came, there apparently being no equivalent slots on other ships at the time, and so he reported back aboard the Connecticut. Rush didn't let up, but by the time Spruance was ordered to the USS Cincinnati in October of 1911, he was a far more assertive and dynamic officer. In the midst of his cross-country travels to reach Mare Island, where his new posting awaited, he used his brief leave to stop by Indianapolis where he fell in love with Margaret Dean. Although a week's leave was only really enough for the two to begin getting to know each other, they would keep up a letter correspondence. Cincinnati was by this stage a somewhat old ship, having been laid down around the time Spruance had been learning to talk in complete sentences, and her mission was to maintain and expand US interests in China, assuming she didn't break down on the way. The Cincinnati's crews netted him a promotion to Lieutenant Junior Grade, and in due time, his first command, as in early 1913, he was transferred off the ship and given USS Bainbridge, the US Navy's first true destroyer, which by this stage was labouring to get herself vaguely active again, having been assigned to the Asiatic Squadron largely on the grounds of being less than two decades old, and so not yet due for scrapping, but otherwise, thanks to the pace of naval technological advancement, hopelessly obsolete. Without much to do, apart from occasionally venturing out, largely to ensure that the engines were still working, Spruance turned his attention to teaching the crew how to swim, which was a new Navy requirement. May 1914, just over a year later, saw a promotion to full lieutenant 
and a return to the continental United States, and thus the continuation of his courtship of Margaret. The courtship was successful, and with the proposal accepted, the wedding was scheduled for the end of 1914, something that was pretty easy to arrange in the still peaceful USA, as compared to Europe, where war clouds were about to break. By the time the arrangements had been firmly put in place for the wedding, and Spruance had reported to his new posting as Naval Inspector of Electrical Machinery at Newport News, World War I had in fact started, but it was of little more notice at that point than some interesting newspaper headlines over in the States, and so in late 1914 and early 1915, life for the new couple consisted mostly of settling into each other's company something that Mrs. Spruance found her husband was well suited for, as he was a strong believer in leaving his work at work and not working overtime when he could avoid it, and thus insisting on spending his time at home working on improving their circumstances. She also discovered that he was on something of a lifelong spiritual journey, vaguely convinced that he believed in something, but never quite sure what that was. In later years, a young lieutenant aboard the USS Mississippi was in the process of trying to guide the ship through a series of rather complex battle manoeuvres in company with a number of other battleships, whilst also being quizzed by Spruance with various inquiries ranging from the subjects of reincarnation through to that of evolution and the development of karma. That the lieutenant was able to satisfactorily respond to all of these inquiries without crashing the battleship into something else netted him a glowing fitness report. But of course all of that was for the future. But it is worth noting at this stage, since the rational and inquisitive approach that he had already showed in life, and in this case as well, would be applied with ruthless cold logic to other future endeavours, like dismantling the Imperial Japanese Navy. But, going back to the 1910s, the Spruances had a son in October 1915, and shortly thereafter, Spruance was moved from being electrical officer for Newport News to roughly the same position but aboard the newly commissioned battleship USS Pennsylvania. About a year into this posting, and the US had declared war on the Central Powers, but unfortunately for Spruance, the oil-burning Pennsylvania had to stay at home. The strain on wartime oil supplies meant that Battleship Division 9, soon to become the 6th Battle Squadron of the Grand Fleet, would be entirely composed of older, coal-burning vessels. Worse still, his technical abilities meant that he was recalled to shore duty, the single worst thing a serving officer wants to hear in wartime, because his skills were needed to help in a crash expansion of the Navy. Temporarily promoted to Lieutenant Commander, Spruance was assigned the task of installing and testing new gunnery fire control systems on every ship coming off the slipways, and any ship that came into port and could be pinned down long enough. He was even granted an unlimited travel permit to chase ships up and down the east coast if they managed to sail off before he got his hands on them. As the war progressed, this travel permission was extended, and he would spend some time tracking down US ships on the other side of the Atlantic and retrofitting their fire control systems, whether they liked it or not. Although deeply committed to this task, the whole situation convinced Spruance to abandon technical specialism. He wanted to be at sea in wartime. At the end of the war, he was briefly diverted to the post of executive officer aboard the Agamemnon. This was not the British pre-dreadnought, but the former Kaiser Wilhelm II, a liner that had been confiscated from the Germans and was now being used to transport US troops back home. Spruance and the captain were the only regular Navy officers aboard, so stretched was the US Navy at this point, but the ship completed three there-and-back voyages in four months, with a letter of commendation for Spruance for keeping the ship clean and smart, and the thousands of troops that she ferried healthy and happy. This would also net him a temporary promotion to the rank of commander. Then the wartime mobilisation ended, and the US Navy was, as typically was the case, cut ruthlessly by Congress, even while dozens of brand new capital ships were being planned or indeed built. Although many of his colleagues would then quit at the enforced idleness, Spruance decided to remain. For this, he was rewarded with his second full command, another destroyer. But this was the brand new USS Aaron Ward, a Wicks class over twice the displacement and well over thrice as heavily armed as the old Bainbridge. 
After a brief stint in the Atlantic, the new destroyer was sent to the Pacific Fleet, based in San Diego. The family temporarily split as Spruance himself took his ship via the new Panama Canal, and his wife and son headed back to Indianapolis for the birth of the family's second child, a daughter. Spruance found his division commander was one William F. Halsey, and the two would quickly become firm lifelong friends. Between the two of them and the other commanders of the Six Strong Formation, they quickly became the envy of their fleet for the tight formations and incredibly aggressive handling they displayed. However, their skill also earned the undying enmity of a number of battleship captains, as in one exercise the destroyers swept down on a formation of four battleships, laid a smokescreen, popped out of it, delivered a massive torpedo salvo with dummy warheads, and promptly vanished back into the smoke. Of course, just having inert warheads doesn't mean the torpedoes were completely harmless. They were still objects that massed a couple of tons apiece hitting the sides of ships going at 30 to 40 miles an hour, but the Navy had budgeted that not too many impacts would be scored and thus repairs would be relatively minimal. Between them, Halsey and Spruance managed to inflict over a million dollars worth of damage on the battleships with multiple impacts. That was about half the total cost of an Omaha-class cruiser. However, Spruance would also prove to be an able commander when faced with true danger. At one point, the Aaron Ward ran into the back of Halsey's ship. The officer on deck hadn't realised that Halsey's flagship had lost power, and thus the rear-end collision. Luckily, the damage wasn't too bad. More seriously, when they were off the coast of South America, the USS Woolsey was accidentally rammed and sunk at night by a merchant ship. Spruance then took his own ship to the scene and quickly organised the rescue of almost the entire crew of the Woolsey, which included one Emmett P. Forrestell, not Forrestall, who would later become Spruance's operations officer. Spruance would also command the USS Percival during his time in this destroyer's division, before summer 1921 brought him back to shore duty and moved him back to the East Coast. Working in Washington, D.C. for the Bureau of Engineering was complemented by an extensive furniture restoration program in their new home, as even back then Washington, D.C. was ruinously expensive and the only place they could afford to rent had been an unfurnished house on 41st Street. At this point, back on shore duty and subject to an act of Congress that dictated that pay ashore was less than that which officers would receive when they were at sea, Spruance considered leaving the Navy, but his father-in-law counselled against it, writing to his daughter, Mrs. Spruance, that her husband was far too honest and, up and upstanding a character to survive very long in the business world. This state of affairs was fortunately quite short-lived. His commander rank was made permanent in 1922, and by early 1924 he was assigned to command the destroyer USS Dale, which was good. But at the same time, his father-in-law died, which was less good. Although it did mean a relatively large inheritance, at least for the time, of $50,000, which he promptly invested to ensure that his wife would have a guaranteed source of income separate from his Navy career. This careful control of finances was typical for Spruance. Much later on, when he achieved the appropriate rank, he bought an admiral's cap, which happened to have its eagle facing left. Shortly after the US got involved in World War II, it was decreed that the eagle should actually face right, but Spruance refused to buy a new hat when the old one was perfectly fine and the new one was being sold at a price of $40. He just cleaned up his old one and challenged anybody to say different. With that said, however, Whatever tight rein he kept on his own personal spending appeared to be largely for the benefit of his family, who were then granted proportionally more from the family budget for their own use. But his command of the Dale would only last 20 days, just enough time to get the ship from Newport to Cherbourg, as his orders had been changed. He was now to become the Assistant Chief of Staff to the Commander of Naval Forces Europe, one Vice Admiral Andrews aboard USS Pittsburgh and his command of Dale was useful mostly for getting him to Europe and delivering Dale to the European squadron. Much like Captain Rush of the Connecticut almost two decades earlier, Andrews was hard to get on with, and constantly argumentative. But once again, this put Spruance's back up. He pushed back, and Andrews consequently gave him excellent fitness reports for his capabilities – 
it seemed that he was another officer who believed in finding his subordinates' true qualities by putting them under ridiculous amounts of pressure. When this tour of duty came to an end, Spruance was ordered to relieve Halsey, taking command of the USS Osborne, which at this point was in European waters, and this command would last until the summer of 1926, when he returned the ship to the US to take up a course at the US Naval War College, complete with a schnauzer that he'd acquired as a puppy during Osborne's last tour of Europe. Here, among other things, Spruance was engaged in a series of war games simulating a war with Japan. They all followed a fairly similar line. The Japanese would start the war with a surprise attack of some kind, advance rapidly, and then conduct a fighting retreat to reduce US forces by attrition before fighting a decisive battle somewhat closer to their home islands. It was a fairly good insight into actual Japanese plans of the time, and indeed their general strategy in World War II, minus of course the extensive use of aircraft carriers. In summer 1927 he graduated and was moved to the Office of Naval Intelligence, and mindful of his career, he got stuck in, but also put in an application for an executive officer's position on a battleship. At the time, there were 16 such slots in the fleet, and 410 potential candidates. If you wanted flag rank, though, you had to have commanded at least a cruiser, and ideally a battleship, with some distinction. A tour as a capital ship's executive officer was therefore a vital prior step to full command. Fortunately, with his good record, he was given one of the coveted slots in late 1929, becoming the executive officer of the USS Mississippi. Unfortunately, this coincided with the start of the Great Depression. Operational budgets were tight, and with the last naval pay law having been passed in the 1900s, personnel budgets were equally thin. But he made the best of it, finding himself back in California with the Pacific Fleet, for a couple of years before returning to the Naval War College in 1931, this time as an instructor in the Correspondence Courses Department. While he was there, the selection board met, and in late 1931, the newly minted Captain Spruance was assured of his future in the Navy, as those who had been considered for captain rank but passed over by the board had to retire. He, of course, was not one of those. But it seemed his career was about to take a detour when, in March 1933, he was appointed to command not a warship, but the repair ship USS Vestal. However, those orders were then cancelled, and instead he was ordered to report as Chief of Staff to Rear Admiral Watson, commanding the destroyers of the scouting force, which meant it was time to go back across the country to California again. His son Edward was left behind waiting for his exam results as he'd applied to the US Naval Academy. When the rest of the family paused their journey in Salt Lake City, Spruance was gratified to read in the Army-Navy Register that Edward had in fact passed the exams and would therefore be admitted. The Great Depression had an odd effect on the US Navy. Congress at the same time cut pay and numbers of men, whilst also ordering more ships to be built in an effort to try and boost the economy. This left the US Navy facing a manning crisis in the middle of a period where a great many men were trying to join, but they weren't allowed for lack of authorised funds from Congress to pay them. Here, with 26 destroyers under his purview, Spruance kept things running and helped the Navy Research Lab test a prototype of what would become sonar, although the seemingly good test results of these meant that later, when Edward told his father he wanted to serve in the submarine branch, his father was decidedly against it on the grounds that he believed submarines would be exceptionally vulnerable in modern warfare. As it was, Edward would go on to command the USS Lionfish in the latter days of World War II, and would survive the experience. Spruance did his best to keep his ships running in the midst of the worst of the Great Depression, when funding was barely enough for shoreside maintenance, let alone going out on operational voyages, before he was posted in early 1935 back to the Naval War College, where he first headed the junior course, then the senior class tactics department, and then that became the head of the operations department. But spring 1938 saw him get what he'd sought for years, command of a battleship, the aforementioned USS Mississippi. Now he was in competition with 53 other captains, totalling the entire commanding officer cadre for the fleet's battleships, carriers and cruisers, to stand out well enough for promotion to flag rank. The battleship had just gotten back from Fleet Problem 19, and the Spruances were now back in California, 
although at this point Edward was able to visit since he was now an ensign aboard the USS Indianapolis, which also happened to be stationed there. The first voyage that the Mississippi made under its new captain was to Bremerton for an overhaul before rejoining Battleship Division 3, where he found new cause to buck against authority. The admiral in charge of the division often departed port later than the well-ordered Mississippi, but would then force his way past Spruance to get to the head of the column. On another occasion, Spruance had elected to let his ship's company have a field day on one Saturday morning, when there would usually have been a morning inspection. The flagship then signalled that there should be no deviation from standard policy, and Spruance promptly was forced to sound an inspection. Donning his dress uniform, he then double-timed it around the ship's deck without breaking stride, promptly declared his inspection complete and satisfactory, and ordered the men to carry on. Early 1939 saw the ship head for the Caribbean for Fleet Problem 20, where the ship stood out amongst its fellows, the crew winning the gunnery and communications competitions, and coming second in engineering. This no doubt helped when later in that year, at 53 years of age, Spruance received a notification that he had been selected for advancement to Rear Admiral. His first command in his new rank was of the 10th Naval District, the Caribbean. The 10th Naval District had been freshly created to supervise extensive base-building activities designed to secure the area and American interests against German U-boats, which by 1940 were beginning to show up. He first had to fight a battle against the continuing efforts from on high to build a naval air station in a swamp, which was going about as well as you could expect. Eventually, he managed to persuade the powers that be to divert their efforts to the Roosevelt Roads and the eastern end of Puerto Rico, and some amusement was then had when a party, celebrating his promotion, was a victim of a printing error, and thus the whole celebration was held in honour of real Admiral Spruance. Then France fell, and as the senior officer on the scene, Spruance had to deal with Admiral Robert of the Marine Nationale, based in Martinique, to try and avoid a shooting war erupting between those ships and British ships in the area, as the British were worried about Vichy France collaborating with Germany. The resolution ended up being that an American destroyer was assigned to patrol the entrance of Martinique Harbour 24-7 to ensure that no French ships tried to make a break for it. Summer of 1941 saw rising tensions, and Spruance was directed to take command of Cruiser Division 5, based out of Pearl Harbour. This had been engineered by Admiral Nimitz, who also placed Cruiser Division 5 as the escort for the carrier task force which was being assigned to Admiral Halsey. Nimitz saw great advantages in pairing up the two old friends again, in what was sure to be the sharp end of things. This was in opposition to what some others wanted. While in the Caribbean, he'd run into Admiral King, who was then in charge of the Atlantic fleet. King, also recognising talent when he saw it, had been trying to get Spruance assigned to his staff in Washington. Spruance then adopted the guise of a stealth admiral. He could sense war was coming, and he wanted to avoid desk duty in general, and Washington DC in particular, at all costs. He instead boarded a liner from San Francisco to take himself and his family to Hawaii, where they were greeted by his son Edward once again, who by now was a lieutenant assigned to the submarine USS Tambor, also based in Pearl Harbor. Spruance hoisted his flag aboard USS Northampton in September 1941, having command of the Pensacola, Salt Lake City, and Chester as well. The Pacific Fleet was in the middle of a crash mobilisation for war, and Cruiser Division 5 was no exception to this. Spruance took them out three times in the autumn of 1941, each time for a nine-day cruise, occasionally meeting up with the Enterprise, which would of course be theirs to escort when war came. Still, his wife and daughter noticed that he seemed worried, and he confided he didn't believe the Navy was ready, or would be ready, in time. On the 26th of November, Spruance issued orders for yet another training voyage. They'd leave with the Enterprise on the 28th of November, and return on the 5th of December, operating alongside three battleships and some destroyers. The force left on time, but then Halsey ordered it split into two. The carrier, Three cruisers and nine destroyers headed east, this included Northampton, with the remaining cruiser, the battleships and a few destroyers assigned to carry on as normal to the scheduled operating area. Halsey and Spruance, of course, were heading eastbound. 
but as soon as the other ships and land were out of sight, Enterprise reversed course, and the entire formation was ordered to general quarters. This was all news to Spruance, but in fact Halsey had secret orders to deliver aircraft to Wake Island, and to destroy any Japanese ship or aircraft that got in his way. This diversion would extend their time at sea by about a day. Then poor weather and the need to refuel the destroyers pushed their timeline back once more, and their arrival back at Pearl Harbor was expected for the morning of the 7th of December 1941. So secret were the circumstances of this voyage that his wife and Josephine, his son's new bride, were waiting for the Northampton on the 5th, and had to be told to go home by Admiral Kimmel, who noticed the confused pair looking out for the carrier and her escorts returning. On the morning of the 7th, the formation was still 200 miles away from Pearl Harbor when radio messages indicating the Imperial Japanese Navy was bombing the place began to come in. Spruance had, of course, long prepared for war, and thus his response to his staff was simply, thank you, you know what to do, and with that his ships shifted to full war footing. After a fruitless search chasing possible Japanese contacts, the formation headed for Pearl Harbor to refuel, with the cruisers entering on the morning of the 8th to a scene of utter devastation. Spruance reported to Admiral Kimmel that Enterprise would be due in later on. In the day, clamped down on some of the wilder rumours about follow-up attacks by the Japanese, offered his opinion that the Japanese Navy was on its way home, and then went home himself. Once he reached his house, he allowed himself a rare moment of emotional breakdown with only his family present to see it. He was utterly devastated by the massive loss of life and the evident unpreparedness of the fleet. But by next morning, he'd managed to regain his control and set out to secure Hawaii as best he could in the absence of any orders to go on the offensive. Both his family and his officers noticed that he actually seemed less stressed now, Instead of having to worry about when war would come, now that war was here, he seemed entirely at ease with the situation, with his only annoyance being Admiral Pai, Kimmel's temporary replacement, being reluctant to do much other than order him to patrol the local waters. Eventually, Admiral Nimitz arrived, and things began to happen. Although at first, this was mostly reactionary. The first major deployment for Spruance was when both Yorktown and Enterprise, under Admiral Fletcher and Admiral Halsey respectively, were ordered to escort reinforcements for Samoa, after which the carriers and their escorts would make a dash north to raid Japanese bases in the Marshall and Gilberts Islands. He set sail on the 11th of January 1942, and the raid would begin on the 25th, once the troops were safely delivered and the escorts could head north. Spruance's part would be to bombard the Wodeje, I think, or Wodej Atoll, while Yorktown and Enterprise would strike multiple other islands. However, the Japanese had held the area for two decades and never allowed anybody near, so they were sailing into an almost unknown territory, with the only intel report coming from a submarine that had done some recon and reported that it had perceived minimal defences in the general area. Spruance thus prepared for a bombardment based on how he would have defended the atoll. Most shore batteries would be concentrated to the east at the entrance of the sheltered harbour, with maybe some other batteries on the small islands to the north and south. He estimated that the maximum shore battery size would be 6-inch guns, and he thus planned to bombard any defences using the superior range of his 8-inch guns guided by his aircraft, before closing to deal with any ships and shore installations with both his heavy guns and the ship's secondaries, which were 5-inch in calibre. A fighter sweep from the Enterprise would open proceedings to suppress enemy air activity, and so the 1st of February dawned with the fighters arriving precisely on time. But the only opposition came from a small gunboat, which came out to take on the fighters and soon found itself overwhelmed and sunk by the destroyer USS Dunlap, albeit it did take the destroyer's inexperienced gunners about half an hour to put the gunboat down. A few small merchantmen were in the lagoon, and the cruisers duly opened fire on them, eventually getting close enough to begin exchanging a ragged fire with Japanese shore guns. But not much was accomplished on either side, thanks to the numerous speculative submarine sightings which constantly forced the cruisers to evade, spoiling their firing solutions, and it turned out that shore bombardment was an entirely different kettle of fish compared to engaging other ships at sea when both parties were moving. Nonetheless, after a couple of hours blowing up random bits of scenery and the occasional Japanese target, 
Spruance ordered his ships back to meet up with Halsey, and the whole force set off for home, belatedly harassed in the late afternoon by a few Japanese aircraft. Their next job was a raid on Wake Island. Enterprise, Northampton, Salt Lake City and six destroyers would be assigned, giving Spruance plenty of time at sea to contemplate how to better improve his ship's shore bombardment accuracy, as well as the level of control he had over his formation when it came under attack, as he felt both had previously been lacking. Along with two destroyers, Spruance's two cruisers broke away to attack from the west at dawn on the 24th of February. Poor weather elsewhere meant Enterprise was unable to launch her aircraft on schedule, but radio silence meant the cruisers were unaware of this. The Japanese were not surprised by the Americans' appearance, and, unmolested by carrier aircraft, various Japanese seaplanes shadowed the cruisers. Spruance launched his own ship's aircraft for spotting purposes and pressed on. The Japanese aircraft then launched their bombing runs. Spruance merely observed them out of a faint interest, as everybody else around him ducked for cover. The same thing occurred when the bombardment began and a spirited exchange with the shore batteries commenced. As the sun rose, it began to partially blind the US fire control teams, and since a few days weren't anywhere near enough to solve the overall issue of shore bombardment accuracy, which would eventually need its own dedicated fire control computer to deal with, Spruance ordered the float planes to drop their bombs on the shore installations and then return. He then ordered firing ceased and his ships to withdraw, just as the late arriving Enterprise aircraft showed up to make their own attack runs. His staff then tried to persuade him to at least take some degree of cover during battle, but Spruance refused, before he headed off to watch the coda to the whole thing, as two small patrol craft that were trying to escape the Enterprise's air attack had been caught by Spruance's destroyers and were summarily sunk. A brief raid on Marcus Island was then ordered, and that passed without too much incident, before the force was finally able to head back to Pearl Harbor. Once back ashore, Spruance took two long walks with other officers. On one occasion, an officer from his staff spoke of the supposed inferior nature of the Japanese as a race. Spruance simply remarked that if this was so, it was ironic that the supposedly superior American race were at that moment worried about whether they'd be able to stop the Japanese advancing from all over the Pacific. On these walks, the damaged and sunken battleships of the Pacific Fleet dominated the view, and soon Spruance found himself both closely inspecting them and reading everything he could get his hands on on carrier and aircraft-based warfare. But this effort was interrupted by his next set of orders, to escort what would become known as the Doolittle Raid. Spruance was privately against the idea, the previous raids they'd conducted didn't seem to have altered Japanese operations all that much, and this one would tie up two precious American carriers and all their escorts. But orders were orders, and so he had a ringside seat to the newly commissioned USS Hornet, speculatively sending medium bombers off into the skies off the coast of Japan. What effect the air groups of Enterprise and Hornet might have had at the subsequent Battle of Coral Sea is of course a matter for speculation. But, in any case, the Doolittle forces were back on the 25th of April, and dispatched back out to sea again on the 30th as belated reinforcements for Yorktown and Lexington. Of course, this meant they were still en route when the Battle of Coral Sea was actually fought, and so all this deployment accomplished was burning a bunch of fuel as the surviving Yorktown headed back from the engagement damaged, and all three Yorktown-class carriers thus were ordered back to Pearl Harbor again. Spruance's forces arrived on the 26th of May, but when he headed over to Enterprise to visit Halsey, the ship was quiet and Halsey was nowhere to be found. Eventually they found a young officer who informed them that Halsey was in hospital and Nimitz wanted to see Spruance. He therefore headed for Nimitz's headquarters to discover Halsey was down with shingles and had recommended Spruance to take command of the task force. He would lead Enterprise and Hornet, with overall fleet command falling to Admiral Fletcher aboard Yorktown, assuming that when Yorktown arrived she could be patched up in time. The reason for the haste was because of the discovery of Japanese plans to invade Midway. Spruance was given two sets of orders. Officially, in writing, he was ordered to attack and destroy the Japanese forces, but the unwritten orders from Nimitz were to preserve his carriers. If the battle went badly, Nimitz would rather let the Japanese have Midway, which could always be retaken, than lose some more of his few remaining operational carriers in some kind of doomed last stand, 
Indeed, even holding Midway, if it came at the cost of the carriers, was seen as a net loss for the US Navy. Spruance duly thus began planning his battle strategy. He knew from intelligence that the Japanese fleet would massively outnumber the Americans in terms of hull numbers, even if Yorktown was made ready in time, and of course, specifically, the Japanese had more carriers, which meant that even if they traded hull for hull, the Japanese Navy would be able to launch follow-up attacks to finish off the American carriers from their undamaged ships. Thus, Spruance planned to attack as early as possible once the Japanese were detected, using all his available aircraft to try and reduce the odds against him as much and as quickly as humanly possible. The risk, of course, was that if the Japanese managed to get their own planes away before the American strike forces arrived, the US carriers would have essentially no defences, as US anti-aircraft gunnery at this stage of the war could be described as speculative at best. Surprise would therefore be the key element. Carrying a manoeuvring board, which he refused to explain to anybody, Spruant settled in aboard the Enterprise as she steamed south, heading for the largest carrier battle the war had ever seen up until that point. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.